Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. On this channel we talk about all things data science, from data science career advice, uh, reviewing tools and techniques, and talking about what it takes to build a high performance data science team. In a previous video we talked about what data science is and how it's composed of statistics, visual storytelling, and machine learning. Uh, today I want to dive into machine learning and hopefully take some of the magic away. We'll talk about some real world examples of how machine learning is used and by the end of the video you'll walk away with an intuitive understanding of machine learning and where it can be applied. Last time we talked about machine learning being a set of tools that allow you to flexibly map inputs to outputs. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about what I mean by flexible and talk to you about that process that happens in the middle. Let's say that somebody's been breaking into your pantry and eating all your food. You're not sure if it's your cat or your dog. So you're gonna set up a video camera and you wanna detect if the cat or the dog is breaking into the pantry. One approach to understanding whether or not the image is of a cat or a dog uh, could be to write a set of rules that differentiate cat images from dog images, right? One rule might be, hey, you know the color of your cat is brown and the color of your dog is gray. And so if there's something brown in the image, it's your cat. If there's something gray in the image, it's your dog. Uh, what if your kid walks by wearing a gray or a brown t-shirt? That, that's not going to work. So you might recognize differences in fur, differences in eye shape, um, differences in movement, uh, the difference of, of a tail. Um, as you can see, this could become tedious. And if you expand this to many, many different cats and many, many different dogs, the number of rules that you're going to need to write to differentiate those is going to be immense, right? And building systems like this um, what we might call expert systems uh, is very complex and they become very difficult to maintain, especially in any real world environment. Um, this is where machine learning comes in. So instead of taking the cat and the dog and thinking really hard about the things that might differentiate them, for, when we do the process of machine learning, we train it to be flexible, to flexibly understand what a cat and a dog is uh, by showing it examples of cats and dogs. So you can think of this as a process of trial and error. But there are plenty of other good examples of this. So you might want to automatically categorize text that comes in the form of a blog or a post uh, about your product as positive or negative. Do people react positively or negatively? Um, for those uh, negative reactions, um, what are they mostly about? Are they about the product size? Are they about the product's features? Are they about the product's appearance? Um, you know, automatically categorizing those things um, can be very important. Another example might be taking uh, input signals of audio and being able to decide what species of bird this is. So let's say that you're studying uh, the species that occupy a particular territory. Um, what you might do is set up a bunch of microphones, record audio, and then pass those through a machine learning process that maps that audio to a specific bird species. Um, you could do the same with tabular data. Let's say that you want to understand what price you should put your house up for rent, given uh, its square footage, how many bedrooms it has, how many bathrooms, where, you know, the area code that it's in. Um, we would want to build a model that maps that set of inputs to a reasonable output. Uh, in this case, what, what rent you should charge to get market rate. Okay, so that leaves us with the question, how exactly do you map from inputs to outputs? Uh, and to give you a better intuition for that, let's look at a specific example, uh, a simple example of playing catch. Typically, the objective to playing catch is to throw the ball um, in such a way that the person that you're playing with can actually catch it, right? Uh, that involves a lot of coordination um, and a lot of timing and gross motor skills. And ultimately, um, this is a process that we learn as humans by trial and error. Um, so what we might do to start is pick up a ball and throw it. Uh, and the first time that we throw it, the ball might go up, straight up, it might go backwards, it might go too far, um, it might not go far enough. What we'll do is we'll try to adjust um, you know, the strength with, with which we threw it in the direction um, such that you know, the, the person on the other end can actually catch it. Um, so you know, training a machine learning model is very similar. So let's think, about the, let's think about the idea that all we have to do is activate a single muscle 
So the first thing that we need to do um, is give the machine learning model a direction, some understanding of the objective that we care about. Uh, and the way that we do that is through writing an error function. In the context of throwing a ball, the error is pretty obvious, right? Um, did you, you know, if we think about the one dimensional error, um, did the ball go too far or did it, was it too short? If it went too far, we need to throw it um, softer. And if it was too short, we need to throw it harder. Um, so how do we tell a machine learning model that? Well, typically what we look at is um, the mean square error. If you think about the error um, around any particular throw, modeling it as the square error, it looks like this nice parabola that you probably recognize from high school, right? Um, so the farther that you go away, the more the error term increases. Um, and so for a machine learning model, we set up this error function. Um, and this gives us a place that um, allows the stupid model to figure out what we actually care about. And all we have to tell the model is get as low as you possibly can in the air, uh, and that's going to get us where we want to go. Um, and so in this particular case, let's say that we did the following throw, it's a little bit too far. Um, the first step is locate yourself on the air function. Um, and so that's the air that we have. Um, and then the next thing is to calculate which way is down. The way that we do that is we calculate the slope of the line and we find the steepest slope, right? Um, in multiple dimensions, this gets more complicated and we'll talk about that in a second. But in this case, it's pretty simple. Uh, we walk to the left because that's getting closer to our goal. Um, and we keep taking steps. You can think of each of these green lines as a trial. Um, until we reach our optimal goal across the number of trials, um, which is we throw it directly at um, our friend. Um, there's obviously a lot of different ways that you can make these steps. So we might make bigger steps, right? And the possible problem with that is we might take a step that's too far and we might, uh, you know, way overestimate the amount we need to adjust the our arm and we might jump all the way to the other side of the error function and actually increase the error by following the right direction. Um, the other thing that you can do is obviously take steps that are much too small um, and so you'll get to the proper answer but you might have to throw the ball hundreds or thousands of times to get there. So it turns out this process of picking the right optimizer or the right path to follow uh, and how big these steps that you want to take to get there are um, is an active area of research. So as you can see with this very simple one dimensional example, um, it's pretty straightforward. And you might ask the question, well, why can't we just get to the bottom uh, right off the bat? Um, and the answer is for this particular example, we could actually calculate the true answer uh, immediately. We've got one parameter, and so that's something we can directly calculate. Um, but if you think about how this process actually works, there's uh, dozens of muscles that are involved with actuating an arm. So this one dimensional function that we've represented here isn't really representative of most of the problems that we're trying to solve in this space. The dimensionality is very high. So let's take a look at an example uh, of that and, and see how that might work. Um, so let's say that we wanted to build the dog uh, cat classifier that we were um, talking about before. Um, and so in this case, the number of inputs is very, very high, right? It's the number of pixels in a particular image that could be on the order of billions. There's a lot of inputs. Um, and so the process of training a classifier, something that's going to properly label this as a cat or a dog, is very similar to what we just talked about optimizing our, our throw distance. So the first step in this process is to make a guess. And you can think of this as making your first throw, right? It's not going to be perfect and that's okay. So um, what we need to know is how to adjust our next throw so that we're more likely to get the right answer. To do that, we first have to figure out where we are on the error curve. So we calculate where we are on the error curve. Um, and then the next step is to understand which way is down. And so remember, um, you know, which way is down in this case is quite a bit more complex because there's millions of parameters that we have to calculate. So this is that process of calculating um, the gradient uh, and then walking down the path of least resistance, right? Um, and so once we walk down and we make those adjustments, we're ready to go make another guess. We're ready to do another trial, right? And so if you think back to that previous picture, we found where we were in the error curve, we moved to the left a little bit, we found where we were in the error curve, we moved to the left, and eventually we found uh, ourselves at the bottom. Um, and, you know, ultimately the goal of a machine learning model is to make accurate predictions. So uh, after the model has been trained um, on the data set that you trained it on, it ought to make good predictions. So in this case, it ought to 
say, hey, this is almost definitely a cat. If we show it a picture of a dog, it should be confident that it's a dog. Um, and the interesting thing uh, with these models, if you show it an ambiguous picture, like a cat that looks like a dog or a picture with both, um, the model is going to be uncertain. It's going to be right in the middle. It's not a cat or a dog. It's sort of both. Um, and those are the sorts of things that we actually study as machine learning engineers and data scientists. Um, you know, those parts where the model gets confused or where it got, you know, the answer very wrong can give us lots of hints on how to improve. So one question you might be asking is, okay, what is that big gap in the middle? What is this sort of dotted line thing? This is where some of the art of data science comes in, right? So the key difference between these models at the highest level is the assumptions that they make about the world. And if you can understand the models, the assumptions that models are making uh, about the world, you have a better uh, chance of selecting the right model for your given problem, right? Um, so if we start on the left-hand side, a uh, naive Bayes model, um, in this case, this is one of the simplest machine learning models out there. Uh, and this model makes strong assumptions about the independence of different variables. So uh, in the case of images, it would make the strong assumption that each pixel is completely independent of each other pixel. Uh, in the case of images, that's actually a very bad assumption. Um, and actually in the case of most problems, including text and, and other things, it's a bad assumption. It turns out that despite that limitation, this model can actually do a pretty good job across a surprising variety of problems. Linear regression, makes the assumption uh, that each of the inputs is linearly associated with the output. You can see that there's uh, a slight nonlinear relationship um, between the inputs and the outputs here. Um, and it turns out that you can actually trick linear regression into doing nonlinear things by um, modifying the inputs, like taking the square of the input or taking the log of the input. So in this case, the model isn't strictly limited to assuming uh, linear interactions. Um, but when you start to get to very, very complex things, like for example, image Images, which are highly nonlinear interactions um, between the input nodes, um, this model starts to fall short, right? If you go all the way to the right hand of the spectrum in terms of flexibility, um, you know, deep learning models make what I would call very weak assumptions about the world. In other words, um, they are able to capture a lot of complexity, including nonlinear complexity and, um, you know, correlated variables and variables that are correlated, or I should say inputs that are correlated in nonlinear ways. Um, it doesn't make any of those assumptions. It's sort of able to fit any function, right? Um, and the key thing that separates deep learning um, is the concept of layering. So um, in deep learning, uh, you know, deep learning models are capable of learning progressively more complex representations of the world. But to give you a concrete example, if you think about um, how computer vision models work, um, the first layer of the network is gonna learn something like edge detection. It's gonna go find all the edges in the room. So that the room that you're sitting in, if you look around for a second, you'll see a bunch of different edges. And it turns out that the neurons in your eyes are tuned to identify those edges. Um, then you can imagine those edges coming together to form shapes and textures. Um, um, so in the case of a cat and a dog, there might be uh, a different texture of the cat's fur versus the dog's fur. And there's going to be representations within the you know, middle part of the network that are going to look like um, patterns and textures, right? And then the next thing, it'll start to look like bits and pieces. So it might, the next layer of the network might learn something like, um, what does an eyeball look like? What does a tail look like? And then towards the end of the network, you'll start to see um, whole pictures of items. It might be, hey, this is the typical shape of, a f of an entire cat body. This is the typical shape of an entire dog body. So deep learning has an incredible ability to learn these layered representations that are able to be, you know, progressively increased in complexity in such a way that um, they can, you know, optimally predict. But the downside is to learn those representations, you need a lot of variety of different examples. Really, the job of a data scientist is to understand the data and the structure of the data in such a way um, that they can be guided to the, the proper model for um, a particular task. Today, my goal was to give you a more intuitive understanding of how machine learning works. If you like the content um, and you want more like it, please consider subscribing. Uh, and if you would, hit that like button below. Thanks.